The topic of today's lecture is Dedekind domains. These objects are important because of their applications in Galois theory, algebraic number theory, and public key cryptography. Let's uh, begin with the definition. A domain R is called a Dedekind domain. If it is Neutherian integrally closed, and uh, has a property that every prime ideal in R is maximal. As a first example of a Dedekind domain, so let us uh, show that if R is a principal ideal domain, then this implies that R is a Dedekind domain. So here we need to show that uh, a PID satisfies the three properties, that it's Neutherian, integrally closed, and has the property that every prime ideal is maximal. So we know that R is Noetherian if and only if every ideal in R is uh, finitely generated. But uh, in a PID, every ideal has a single generator by definition. And thus, uh, a PID is new theory. For property two, we know that if R is a principal ideal domain, then R is a unique factorization domain. And uh, we saw that every unique factorization domain is integrally closed. And for property three, we know that if R is a principal ideal domain, then uh, every prime ideal I is uh, generated by an irreducible element. And hence, I is maximal. In a sense, PIDs are trivial examples of Dedekind domains. Let us mention some non-trivial examples. And uh, only in the next lecture we will be able to prove uh, that these uh, two examples that we give are actually Dedekind domains. So our second example is, uh, so let E be a Galois extension of Q. And let S be the ring of elements in E integral over Z. Then S is a Dedekind domain. Our third example is of geometric nature. Let R be the ring of polynomial functions on a non-singular elliptic curve. given by equation y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax squared 
plus bx plus c. Then this uh, ring R is uh, a dedicated domain. Example 2 is related to Galois groups and algebraic number theory. And example 3, or more generally, polynomial functions on algebraic curves over a finite field are used in public key cryptography. Let us introduce the following important notion in the theory of dedicated domains. Definition. Let R be a domain with a field of fractions F. And uh, R submodule M in the field of fractions F is called a fractional ideal. If there exists alpha in R, which is non-zero, such that alpha times m is uh, inside R. The last property says uh, that m is inside 1 over alpha times R. Let's uh, give an example of a fractional ideal. So if uh, R is z and f is q, and take m to be 3 halves z. So these are fractions uh, with numerators that are divisible by 3 and denominator equal to 2. This will be a fractional ideal. And uh, if we take alpha equals 2, then if we multiply this uh, z submodule by 2, then the result will be inside integers. Let us think, what are ideals in R? Well, an ideal is an additive subgroup in R, which is closed under multiplication by all elements of R. So this means that uh, these are exactly R submodules in R. And so we can conclude that ideals in R are exactly fractional ideals that are contained in R. So if we take in the definition of a fractional ideal alpha equals 1, then we will get just a usual ideal of the ring R. We have the following important remark that uh, if M is a fractional ideal such that alpha times M is inside R, then alpha M is an ideal in R. And alpha M is isomorphic to M as R modules. Because multiplication by alpha will be the isomorphism between M and alpha M. If uh, the ring R is Neutherian, then every ideal is finitely generated this implies that if m is a fractional ideal then alpha m is a finitely generated r module because ideals are exactly r modules and because alpha m is isomorphic to m as r modules so this implies that any fractional ideal M is uh, finitely 
generated as R module. And we get the following lemma. So let R be Noetherian. Then uh, fractional ideals are precisely finitely generated R submodules in the field of fractions of R. Here we already saw that if R is Noetherian and M is a fractional ideal, then M is finitely generated as an R submodule. Conversely, if M is an R submodule in the field of fractions of R with generators A1 over B1 dot 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 a n over b n, then if we take alpha to be the product b1 times b2 times uh, b n, then we can easily see that alpha times m will be inside r. So here we will be able to clear out all denominators by multiplying by the product of the denominators of the generators. Denote by curly f or f of r the set of all fractional ideals of r. We make the following claim that f of r is closed under multiplication. That is, the product of two fractional ideals is again a fractional ideal. So indeed, let M and N be two fractional ideals. And suppose alpha M is inside R and beta N is also inside R. Then, of course, alpha times beta times the product mn is uh, inside r and mn is isomorphic to alpha m times beta n as r modules. And uh, alpha m is an ideal in r and beta n is an ideal in r. And we know that the product of two ideals is an ideal. So the right hand side is an r submodule and thus the left hand side as well. We point out that the set of fractional ideals has a unit element, which is R. And indeed, for any fractional ideal, R times M is equal to M. Well, one inclusion is obvious because M is an R submodule, and the opposite inclusion holds because R contains a unit. This motivates the following definition, that fractional ideals A and B are inverses of each other if A times B is equal to R. And as an example, so if we have 3 halves times Z and we multiply it by 2 thirds times Z, then the result will be Z. So these two fractional ideals are inverses of each other. Now we state the main theorem of uh, this lecture. 
let R be a domain. The following conditions are equivalent. One, R is a dedicated domain. Two, every fractional ideal of R has an inverse. And three, F of R is uh, a multiplicative group. And of course, we need to make small corrections to our definitions. So here we should consider only non-zero fractional ideals. And likewise, we should specify non-zero here as well. We point out that the set of fractional ideals is also closed under addition. So if m and n are fractional ideals such that alpha m is inside R, and uh, beta n is inside R, where alpha and beta are elements of R, then uh, of course m plus n is uh, an R submodule in F, and uh, alpha times beta m plus n will be of course inside R. Let us uh, give the following warning that uh, the set of all fractional ideals of R is not a ring. And the reason for this is that we do not have uh, additive inverses here. So if M is a non zero fractional ideal, then m plus n will always contain m, and this means that m plus n cannot be a zero ideal. The goal of this lecture is to prove this main theorem, that if we have a dedicated domain, then the set of non-zero fractional ideals is a multiplicative group. The proof of this theorem will be based on several ring theoretic lemmas. We have a class of examples of dedicated domains that come from algebraic geometry. These are polynomial functions on algebraic curves. For this reason, I find it useful to use geometric intuition when we work with dedicated domains. And in order to use this geometric intuition, let us go over the dictionary that translates algebra into geometry in the context of algebraic geometry. Let us present the dictionary of algebraic geometry. So in the algebra side, we have the concept of a ring. On the geometry side, this will be a polynomial functions on an algebraic variety. And to make things simpler, let's take this over algebraically closed field. And as an example, here we can take C of x, y. So this will correspond to a fine plane, A2. So two-dimensional plane, but only taken over complex numbers. On the algebra side, we have the notion of ideal. Geometrically, 
this will mean an algebraic subvariety. So on uh, this example, so this will be a bunch of curves and points on this plane. And uh, so some points and curves could come with multiplicity. So for example, this point we can take with multiplicity 2. So this ideal will consist of polynomial functions on a plane that vanish on uh, these uh, curves and at these points, and at this point it will vanish with multiplicity 2. Then uh, prime ideals will correspond to irreducible sub-varieties. So if we take a single curve on this plane, which cannot be decomposed into a union of two algebraic curves, then uh, the algebra of polynomial functions that vanish on this single curve will be a prime ideal. Or we have another example of a prime ideal, is functions that vanish at a given point. And we have the notion of a maximal ideal. This will correspond to points. So the set of functions that vanish at a given point form a maximal ideal. And Hilbert's Nullstellensatz claims that over an algebraically closed field, any maximal ideal will correspond to some point on the algebraic variety. One of the defining properties of dedicated domains is that prime ideals must be maximal. So from here we see that c of x, y is not a dedicated domain. Because uh, we have uh, prime ideals that correspond to irreducible curves on a fine plane. But uh, these prime ideals are not maximal. Because if we select a point on uh, this curve, then the ideal of functions that vanish at this point will be strictly greater than the ideal of functions that vanish on the curve. So what we see is that dedicated domains geometrically correspond to algebraic curves as underlying varieties. So this means that if our variety is one-dimensional, then prime ideals will be points on this variety, and thus prime ideals will be maximal. Then arbitrary ideals in the case of a curve will correspond to a finite number of points on this curve, and perhaps some of the points are taken with multiplicity. And then the ideal will consist of polynomial functions on this curve that vanish at the prescribed points with prescribed multiplicities. I find it useful to keep this uh, geometric interpretation in mind when we discuss algebraic properties of dedicated domains. Let us state our first lemma. Let R be a Neutherian domain. And let i be an ideal in R. Then there exist prime ideals p1 through pn such that for all j the ideal i sits inside pj, and uh, the product of these prime ideals, p1 times p2 times pn, sits inside the ideal i. Let's give a proof of this theory. So let i be a maximal counterexample. And uh, this maximal counterexample will exist because R 
is new theory. And uh, any chain of increasing counterexamples will be an increasing chain of ideals. And in a new theory and ring, we cannot have an infinite increasing chain of ideals. We note that I, this counterexample, cannot be prime. Because otherwise, we take a single prime ideal, which is I itself. This means that uh, there exist elements A and B in the ring R, such that uh, A and B are not in I, but the product is uh, an element of I. Then we consider ideals A, which is generated by I and element A, and ideal B, which is generated by ideal I and element B. These ideals are strictly greater than the ideal I, then uh, since I was a maximal counterexample, then A and B satisfy the claim of the lemma. So that is, there exist ideals P1 through PK such that A is contained in each of them and the product sits inside A. And likewise, there exist ideal PK plus one through PN such that B is inside each of those And the product PK plus one times PN is inside B. But then since uh, I is inside A and also is inside B, then uh, this tells us that for all J from one to N, we will have that I sits inside the ideal PJ. And if we take the product of uh, all these ideals, then this will be inside A times B, which is uh, I together with element A and uh, I together with element B, but uh, A times B belongs to ideal I. And so this means that this product is inside I. And we get a contradiction because now we see that the ideal I will satisfy the claim of this lemma. And we assumed that I was a counterexample. Our next lemma is the following. Let R be a Neutherian domain in which every prime ideal is maximal. Suppose we have the following. So suppose we have a non-zero ideal A, which sits uh, inside ideal P, which is different from the ring R. So these are B ideals. Where ideal P is prime. Set U to be the set of elements X in R such that X times P is uh, inside a. Then U is an ideal in R and A is inside U but not equal to U. Let us give a proof. So what is obvious here 
is that u is an ideal. Indeed, if x belongs to u, then x times y will also belong to u since a is an ideal. And it is also obvious that a is uh, inside u since a times r is inside a. And this implies that a times p is also inside a. So what we really need to prove here is uh, that a is different from u. So that is that there exists an element u in u which is not in a. By previous lemma there exist prime ideals p1 through pn such that for all j a is inside pj and the product p1 times pn is inside a which is inside p and uh, we can choose the number of factors n as small as possible The case when n is equal to 1 is trivial because in this case we have that a is inside p1, p1 is inside a, so this means that a is equal to p1 and so it's a prime ideal. And uh, then we have two prime ideals, p1 that sits inside p and uh, our assumption is that prime ideals are maximal. So this means that p must be equal to p1 here and uh, then u is uh, equal to r and then the claim of the lemma will follow from our assumption that p is not equal to r. So we are going to consider the case when n is greater or equal to 2. Here we point out that there exists a j such that uh, prime ideal pj is inside p. Otherwise if none of the ideals pj are completely inside p, then for each j we can choose an element in pj which is not in p and then we will obtain that the product of elements that are not in p is inside the prime ideal p, which is a contradiction. So without loss of generality, so we assume that pn is inside p, but then we have two prime ideals, one contained in another. And our assumption that every prime ideal is maximal and p is different from r. So this tells us that pn must be equal to p and uh, then this condition says that p1 times pn minus 1 times p is inside a. But uh, by the definition of uh, the ideal u, we will have that the product p1 through pn minus 1 is in u. But by minimality of n, we have that this product is not inside a, which implies that u is not inside a. And uh, this is uh, our claim. One of our goals is to prove that in a Dedekind domain, any non-zero fractional ideal has a multiplicative inverse. So let A be a non-zero fractional ideal. A reasonable guess as to what that inverse might be is the following. So we are going to set the set a to the negative 1 to be the set of all alpha in f such that alpha times a is uh, inside r. And we are going to prove that for Dedekind's domains a to the negative 1 is precisely the inverse of a. We point out that uh, 
this set a to the negative one is uh, indeed a fractional ideal. Well, the fact it's uh, an R submodule is obvious. And if D belongs to the intersection of A with R, and by definition of a fractional ideal, we will always have elements of A that are in R, then we can see that D times A to the negative one will be inside R. So indeed, if alpha is an A inverse, this means that alpha times A is inside R. But uh, what is uh, alpha times D? By definition of D, D is an A, so this is an R, and we see that D times any element of A to the negative one is uh, inside R. Let us state our next lemma. Let P be a non-zero prime ideal in a dedicated domain R. Then P is invertible. The product of P with uh, P to the negative one is equal to R. Let us give a proof. So in case when P is equal to R, so the result is obvious. Because in this case, we have one is an element of R, and from here it follows that the R to the negative one is equal to R. And then r times r to the negative one is equal to r as well. Now we assume that p is different from r. It follows immediately from the definition that uh, r is inside p to the negative one. So what we claim is uh, that p to the negative one is strictly larger than r, so that r is not equal to p to the negative one. Take a non-zero element a, which is in the prime ideal p, and apply the previous lemma to the principal ideal capital A generated by the element little a. Clearly, this principal ideal A will be inside the prime ideal P. That lemma said that if we consider the set U, which is all elements X in R, such that X P is inside A, then A is inside U, but U is not inside A. So what we get here is that we have the ideal U such that U times P is uh, inside the principal ideal generated by A, which is element A times the ring R. This is equivalent to saying that one over A times U times P is inside R, which by definition of uh, P to the negative one implies that one over a times u is inside p to the negative one. By the claim of the previous lemma, we have that u is not inside a r, and uh, this means that one over a times u is not inside r. Now we've got that one over a times u is inside p to the negative one, but not is inside R. So this tells us that uh, R is uh, different from P to the negative one, and thus P to the negative one is strictly greater than R. Consider the product P times P to the negative one. 
What can we say about this? By definition of p to the negative 1, this is inside R. And in fact, this is an ideal inside R. Simply because p is an ideal, and when we try to multiply this set by something in R, so this factor will get absorbed inside p. Moreover, we have from definition of p to the negative 1 that 1 belongs to p to the negative 1. And this implies that p will be inside p times p to the negative 1. But our ring is dedicated. And every prime ideal is maximal. So this means that p is a maximal ideal. And the p times p inverse is an ideal that contains a maximal ideal p. So this tells us that either p times p to the negative 1 is equal to p, or p times p to the negative 1 is equal to r. Our lemma claims that the second equality holds. So all we have to do is to rule out the first equality. Let us assume that p times p to the negative 1 is equal to p and show that this leads to a contradiction. So this implies that p to the negative 1 is a subring in f. Indeed, p times p to the negative 1 times p to the negative 1 is equal to, by our assumption, p times p to the negative 1 is equal to p. So this is p times p to the negative 1 and is equal to p, which is inside r. This implies that p to the negative 1 times p to the negative 1 is inside p to the negative 1. So p to the negative 1 is closed under multiplication. And uh, from its definition, it's clear that uh, this is an additive subgroup. So this means that p to the negative 1 is indeed a subring in f. But p to the negative 1 is a fractional ideal. And r is Noetherian. So this implies that p to the negative 1 is a finitely generated R module. But we proved that the ring extensions that are finitely generated R modules are integral. So this means that p to the negative 1 is integral over R. And it sits inside F. But one of the properties of a dedicated ring is that R is uh, integrally closed. And we conclude that P to the negative 1 is equal to R. But this is a contradiction because we already proved that p to the negative 1 is not equal to r, it's strictly greater. So our conclusion that uh, of the two possibilities, it's uh, the second possibility that will hold, that p times p to the negative 1 is equal to r, and so p to the negative 1 is indeed the inverse of the prime ideal p, and p is invertible. And we have one more lemma to prove. Let R be a domain and uh, let A be an invertible fractional ideal. 
then a is uh, finitely generated as R module. Let's give a proof. Suppose A is invertible, so A times B is equal to R for some fractional ideal B. So what we claim is that B is equal to A to the negative 1. So this is the set of X in F such that X times A is inside R. Indeed, clearly, since A times B is equal to R, then this uh, implies that uh, B is inside A to the negative 1. Also, A to the negative 1 is inside A to the negative 1 times R, but R is A times B. So this is inside A to the negative 1 times A times B. But A to the negative 1 times A is inside R. So we get R times B, which is inside B. So we proved double inclusions, and uh, this means the equality of these two sets. And this is a useful fact to remember, so that if uh, indeed we have a fractional ideal which is invertible, then the inverse is given by this A to the negative 1 construction. Now, since A times A to the negative 1 is equal to R, so this implies that 1 can be written as the sum of uh, over I of AI times alpha I, where AIs are in fractional ideal A and alpha I's are in the fractional ideal a to the negative 1. We claim that the set of AIs is the set of generators of A as R module. Indeed, let's take an element B in A. Then B can be written as 1 times B. And then this becomes the sum over i, which is finite, of a i times alpha i times b. But here we have that alpha i's are in a to the negative 1 and b is in a. So this tells us that alpha i times b is in r for all i. And so this sum can be written as the sum over i, a i times r i, where these are elements of r. And this shows that a is generated by elements a i's as r module, which implies the claim of the lemma. Now we have laid the foundation for the proof of our main theorem. Let us recall the statement of our main result. Let r be a domain the following conditions are equivalent 1 r is a dedicate domain two every non zero ideal in R is invertible and 3 the set of non-zero fractional ideals is a group multiplicative group our plan is to prove that 1 implies 2 2 implies 3 and 3 implies 1 so let's carry out this plan. So 1 implies 2. So we assume that R is dedicant. And we are going to reason by contradiction. So we assume 
that uh, there exist non-zero, non-invertible ideals. And let i be a maximal element in uh, the set of uh, non-invertible non-zero ideals. And since i is Noetherian, such a maximal element will exist because every increasing chain of ideals will terminate. By lemma, i is not prime because we proved that all prime ideals are invertible. Now fix two elements a and b which are not in i with the product being in i. So this is possible because the ideal i is not prime. And construct two ideals a which is generated by i and element a and b which is generated by i and element b. So here we have that i is strictly contained in each of the a and b and the product a times b will be inside i. Since i is maximal non-invertible, this implies that both a and b are invertible ideals. So we have that a times a inverse is equal to r and b times b to the negative 1 is equal to r. We saw that if an ideal is invertible then its inverse is given by a to the minus 1 construction. Consider the product i times b inverse. So i sits inside b, so this is inside b times b inverse, which is inside r. So this means that i b inverse is inside r and it's clearly it's an ideal because it's closed under multiplication by elements of r, they just get absorbed inside i. So this tells us that i b inverse is an ideal in r. Also i sits inside the a and a being an ideal is equal to a r but r is equal to b times b inverse. And by our construction of the ideals a and b, a times b inside i. So what we get is that this is inside i b inverse. So we see that i b inverse is an ideal in r which is strictly greater than i. And from here we conclude that c which is i b inverse is invertible. Which means that c times c to the negative 1 is equal to r. But then since c is i times b to the negative 1, we get that i to the b to the negative 1 times c to the negative 1 is equal to r. And this implies that i is invertible since i times the fractional ideal b to the negative 1 times c to the negative 1 is equal to r. Which is a contradiction because we assumed that ideal i was not invertible. Now we prove that in a Dedekind domain every non-zero ideal is invertible. Now let us prove that 2 implies 3. We are given that every non-zero ideal is invertible. And to show that f of r is a multiplicative group, so we need to prove that every non-zero fractional ideal
is invertible. Let A be a non-zero fractional ideal. Then, by definition of a fractional ideal, there exists an alpha in R, which is non-zero, such that alpha times A is uh, a non-zero ideal in R. By our assumption, every non-zero ideal is invertible. So this tells us that there exists a fractional ideal B such that B times alpha A is equal to R. But this can be written as uh, B times alpha times A is uh, equal to R. And this tells us that uh, alpha B is uh, the inverse of A. It remains to prove that 3 implies 1. So we assume that f of r is a multiplicative group and we need to prove that r is Noetherian, it is integral, and every prime ideal is maximal. Let a be a non-zero ideal in r. By assumption, a is invertible. And uh, by lemma, we prove that every invertible ideal is finitely generated. So A is uh, finitely generated, well, as R module, so or as an ideal. And this implies that R is Noetherian, because uh, one of the equivalent properties of Noetherian rings is that every ideal is finitely generated. Let us show that R is integrally closed. So let alpha be an F and alpha integral over R. We need to show that alpha is an element of R. So consider the ring extension R with a joint alpha. Since alpha is integral over R, this implies that R of alpha is uh, a finitely generated R module. But we saw that finitely generated R submodules in F are fractional ideals. So this tells us that R of alpha is uh, a fractional ideal. But we also know that R of alpha is a ring. So this means that R of alpha times R of alpha is equal to R of alpha. By our assumption, any non-zero fractional ideal is invertible. So what we have is R of alpha times R of alpha inverse is equal to R. Let us take our previous equality and multiply both sides by R of alpha inverse. So we have R of alpha inverse times R of alpha times R of alpha is equal to R of alpha inverse times R of alpha. And from here we conclude that R of alpha is equal to R, which means that alpha is an element of R. And that's what we wanted to prove in order to show that R is integrally closed. So we took an element alpha in the field of fractions, which is integral over R, and we proved that this alpha must be in R.
Finally, let us show that 3 implies that every non-zero prime ideal P in the ring R is maximal. So we suppose that we have a non-zero prime ideal P, which is strictly contained in the ideal A. We need to show that A is equal to R. And we know that every ideal is invertible. So let us consider P times A inverse. And since P is inside A, so this is inside A times A inverse, which is equal to R. Then we get that P times A inverse is uh, an ideal in R. And we have that P times A inverse times A is uh, inside P times A inverse times A, which is uh, inside P times R, which is inside P. So we get that the product of these two ideals is inside P, and P is a prime ideal. If a product of two ideals is inside a prime ideal, then one of the factors must be inside P. Otherwise, we can choose elements inside each factor which are not inside P, and we will get a contradiction that the product of two elements outside P is inside P. Our assumption was that A is not inside P. So this tells us that uh, the ideal P A inverse must be inside the prime ideal P. Let us consider our ring R. Since both P and A are invertible, R may be written as A P inverse times P times A inverse. Because indeed here P inverse times P is equal to R and A times A inverse is also equal to R. But here we prove that P A inverse is inside P. So this is inside A P inverse times P and P inverse times P is equal to R. So this is equal to A R which is equal to A. And uh, here we proved that R is inside A and of course A was inside R. So we get the desired equality that A is equal to R. And this proves that every prime ideal is maximal. This completes the proof of our theorem.